Genesis chapter 17. And it is there that the Holy Spirit has highlighted for us this context of Scripture, beginning with verse number 1. Genesis chapter 17. Verse 1 says, And when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me, and you be perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name anymore be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made you. And I will make you exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come out of you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto them and to your seed after you. And I will give unto you and to your seed after you the land wherein you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Fast forward to verse 15. And God said unto Abram, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and I will give you a son also of her. Yeah, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Then Abram fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abram said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son indeed. And you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto you at this set time in the next year and he left off talking with him and God went up from Abram fast forward to chapter 21 Genesis chapter 21 verse number 1 and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said and the Lord said unto Sarah as he had spoken and Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time which God had spoken to him. And Sarah called the name of his son that was born unto him whom Sarah bare to him Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac being eight days old as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. I want to tag this text, the deal is still on. It may be seated in the Lord's church. When it's time for me to go buy a suit, a couple of things factor into my selection process. Number one, 
I more than likely will pick a suit that I envision how it'll make me look once I wear it. It's not just how the suit looks, but it's how I see myself in it. That affects my decision upon whether I'm going to get that suit, select that suit, choose that suit. It's a store full of suits, but I can't walk out of there with all of them. I'm going to pick the one that I see myself in and based upon that moment of vision, how that suit's going to make me look. But the second factor that goes into that decision is money. When I know I'm going to go buy a suit, I'm not going to the store knowing I don't have the money to buy it. I've already got a, a little store in mind of what I will spend for a suit. And if that suit fits how I want it to look, if it looks like it's going to make me look halfway decent, and I got the money to buy it, I'm going to buy it. Unfortunately, y'all pray for me. I'm not a bargain shopper. I go in the store. I see it. If I got the money and I want it, I'm just going to buy it. I ain't got time to be running all over town. <laughs> running back from store to store. If I see it, I like it. I like how it might make me look, and I got the money to get it, I'm buying the suit. So what goes into the decision, first of all, I pick a suit based upon how it's going to make me look and not how it looks. Secondly, I'm going to get the suit if I got what it takes to pay the price. And thus my selection process has to deal with how the suit will make me look and if I got the money to pay for it. Might I suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that God's election process works just the same. God chooses who he wants to choose based upon how he knows it's going to make him look. But secondly, he chooses it because he already has what it takes to pay the price. But there's one other factor about this process that you need to be aware of. Just because I selected it and paid the price for it doesn't mean I'm ready to wear it. I still got to get it tailored. It's got to be marked on and cut on and cut down to the measurements of my physique. That even after I bought it, there's some work to be done on that particular suit. And since you're acting slow on that side of the church, <laughs> Jesus Christ bought you raw material. But there's still some work to be done on you so that you fit his specifications. You still ain't feeling me, so let me help you. He selected you based upon how you make him look. That's glory. He paid the price to take you out the store. That's redemption. 
and once he paid the price to take you out the store he has to work on you so that you fit him and not you that's sanctification can I, can I tell you ladies and gentlemen that God is not just securing you for you but he is securing you to work on you so that you meet his specification that's the discipline discovered in the discourse here of Genesis chapter 12 this is a strange and yet strong passage of scripture that points to the sovereign election of God. Genesis, ladies and gentlemen, is not just about the record of the origins of humanity and God's creation process, but Genesis, ladies and gentlemen, has a larger meta-narrative. The larger meta-narrative of Genesis is the beginning of God's process of restoring his presence among his people and Genesis discusses how God begins that process and the rest of the Bible is an exposition on that one issue that when Adam and Eve were expelled out of the Garden of Eden, they were expelled from the uninterrupted presence of God. And there was separation between God and humanity. And now God goes on this long journey of trying to restore his manifested presence that was broken in the garden. And he does it in Genesis by, first of all, establishing a covenant and a people through which he would manifest his restored, uninterrupted presence. And he has to select somebody, some family, some individual who would be the conduit of his covenant. And at the close of Genesis chapter 11, he selects somebody. But the problem is, the person he selected was a heathen. The person he selected was from Ur of the Chaldees, who is polytheistic. He worships many gods. He has no history, no experience, no pedigree, no theology, and no knowledge of Yahweh. He is in the process of worshiping pagan gods. And out of nowhere, because he felt like it, God's voice interrupts a pagan worshiper and selects this man by the name of Abram who for all intensive purposes is ungodly. He doesn't know Yahweh. His, his mother and father never went to Sunday school. They know nothing about Yahweh they know nothing about this 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 almighty all sufficient God and God interrupts this man's pagan life catch that church Abram did not meet God in church Abram met God cause God met Abram in the world, in, 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 in a state of unholiness and ungodliness in the midst of his pagan worship, Abraham's gods, Abram's gods could not block out the voice of the real God. He's in the midst of worshiping pagan gods 
and the voice of God interrupts and disrupts and cancels his sinful activity while he's in it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, most of you don't have this testimony because you met the Lord in a church service on a Sunday morning with your suit and tie on, with your wig on and all that. You dressed up in heels. That's when you met the Lord. But there are those among us who will testify, I didn't meet the Lord in no church. I met the Lord in the drug house. I, I met the Lord in the hotel. I met the Lord at the club because they got the shooting and I walked out of there. I can't get no help in here. Where are the real people at who testify? I met the Lord in the supermarket. I, I met the Lord driving down the street because I had an accident and walked away from it. God often introduces himself in the midst of your sin. God is not limited to the sacred portals of this man-built building. God has a way of sneaking in your hospital room. God has a way of sneaking in your sin, in your relationships, in your sickness, in your bad business deals, in your ungodly activity. While you're in the process of dying in sin, God will sneak in your business. That's what happened to Abel. And when he introduces himself to Abram he doesn't introduce himself to Abram he just shows up in Abram's life and when he shows up in Abram's life he does not disclose who he is he just shows up and gives Abram some promises that are based on one condition move from where you are yes, sir. <laughs> When God first meets Abram in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, he doesn't even know who's talking to him. He has no clue, no indication of the character and the dispensation of God. God just shows up and says, man, I got promises. All I want you to do is leave from where you are. The promises, ladies and gentlemen, encompass three things. Blessing, land, and seed. The only thing he ever promised Abram was blessing, land, and seed. And the only thing Abram got to do is get over what he got in order to get what he don't have. <laughs> only thing he got to do is leave from where he is in order to get what God got for him he's just got to leave now listen y'all if God is the one offering the promises then the burden is on God Lord have mercy see ladies and gentlemen a promise is a right of expectation that the promiser gives you to expect him or her to do what they say. If I promise you something, I am giving you the right to expect me to come through on my promise. So the burden ain't on the person receiving the promise. The burden is on the person who made the promise. All I'm asking you to do is move. Catch it, church. Abram moves. He grabs his wife and moves gets this revelation at age 75 
in Genesis chapter 22. He's 75 years old. And 11 years later, there is no child. There's no seed. So his old lady, Sarai, uh -huh. Uh -huh. makes a recommendation yeah, yeah, yeah. that why don't you utilize my fertile handmaiden in the name of Hagar. Let her be the surrogate and she will bring forth your seed. Abraham consents to the recommendation, impregnates Hagar, and before she could have the baby, Sarai is jealous of the affection that's going on between her husband and her recommendation. So she is so jacked up, she puts out a pregnant woman on the street. She hadn't even had the child yet. 11 years later, she gives, Hagar gives birth to Isaac's firstborn child. His name is Ishmael. And at the close of chapter 16, the last verse of chapter 16 says, And Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. That's the last verse of chapter 16. But the first verse of chapter 17 says, And the Lord appeared to Abram at 99. Let me try this again. Ishmael is born at age 86. That's the last verse of chapter 16. There's that little white part in between verse six, chapter 16 and chapter 17. That's 13 years of nothing. And 13 years later, Abram is 99 years old. And the Lord appears to him at age 99 and says, hey, bud, let me remind you of something that I told you 24 years ago. When I first called you in Ur of Chaldees in chapter 12, let me remind you of what I told you that I said, I'm going to bless you. I said I'm going to make your name great kings shall come from you a seed is going to come from you and I'm going to keep my covenant with you and your seed after you y'all missed it so I'll shout myself hey Sarai you recommended Hagar because God was taking too long You were barren and God was taking too long so you decided you would help God out and offer your fertile handmaiden to be a surrogate when that was never God's plan in the first place. So you ran out of patience waiting on God and offered an alternative plan. Let me just pause parenthetically and tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the recommendation of Hagar was not necessarily sinful. It was customary. In the days of the text, it was a social custom that women could offer their handmaidens as surrogates to their husbands if they were barren. So what she was doing, y'all, peek your face in here. Sarai was trying to secure a spiritual promise through a carnal policy. And God's argument is when I promise you something, I ain't got to use the world system to get it to you. When I promise you something, my process is already worked out. And because you fail to trust me, because you quit your faith on me, I'm going to show back up, 
13 years later just to tell you the deal is still on you gave up on me you quit on me you failed to hang in there until I was ready but I got good news for you even though you messed up even though you threw in the towel even though you quit your faith the deal is still on that's God's word for somebody in here God got you waiting and you tired of waiting so you're going to go to plan B and plan C but the good news is y'all <laughs> the deal I made with you was never based on whether you believe me or not the deal I made with you was based on what I want to do through you Because I made this covenant. And when I made the covenant, it wasn't based on what you could or could not do. It was based on what I wanted to do through you. So here's the theology. Here's the theology, Dr. Jackson. I don't know. Y'all better theologians than me, so just excuse my ignorance right here. I do not know if God is faithful to me. But what I do know is that God is faithful to his word concerning me. I'm not sure if he's faithful to me, but he's already made some decisions concerning me and his purposes for me supersede my inability to trust him. Boy, y'all don't know when to get happy. Can I tell you, that's the reason why some of you didn't die in your sin because purpose is bigger than your sin. That's the reason why you didn't die on the hospital bed because God's purpose was bigger than your sickness. That's the reason why you still here after all you've done wrong because God's purpose is bigger than your sin. I don't know if God is faithful to me I don't know I can't stand here and tell you that but what I can tell you is that before I got here God already decided what he wanted to do with me <laughs> Lord I can't get no help in here that before I ever got here I was chosen in him before the foundation of the world before my mama and daddy ever hooked up God already decided in the council of eternity past that he was going to be here and his, his purposes would be according to what I want him to do so everything else he's done he might mess himself up but he ain't going to die until all of my purposes are accomplished in his life would you grab your neighbor by the hand and tell them neighbor I don't care what you're going through I don't care how bad it is you are not going to die until all of God's purposes are fulfilled in your life you can go through divorce you can go through disease you can lose a job you can be blasted on social media it doesn't matter when God's purposes are on your life you ain't going nowhere till God's purposes are done That's why every weapon formed against you didn't prosper because it can't conquer God's purposes. Tell somebody I just figured out why I'm still here. Tell them I just figured out. Anybody here already know you should have been dead. Ain't nobody got to tell you that you should have been dead. You know yourself you shouldn't have made it this far. God says, I know you messed up. 
but the deal is still on. The reason why the deal is still on because if the deal is not going on then it means your sin was more powerful than God's purpose. And God is not that weak. <laughs> I just said something you didn't hear me. I said God is not that weak that he is intimidated by your sin. Paul puts it this way. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. It, it doesn't mean that, that the gifts of callings of God means that God excuses sin. It just means that he doesn't change his mind just cause you sin. <laughs> Can I tell y'all something about God? Only 50 of y'all gonna catch this. And I'm gonna make number 51. God has anointed you and gifted you and called you and assigned you knowing everything wrong with you. He know you have crazy. He know you ain't no good. He know you are high mess but God still knows everything about you and still anointed you still called you still giving you assignment he know you crazy Touch your neighbor and tell you, you ain't got to tell God on me. You ain't giving God some report he don't already know. You ain't giving God no intelligence, no FYI. It's interesting that the first Jew was a Gentile. The first Jew was a polytheistic worshiper who had no history or background with God. And God called him to be the progenitor of all the people of faith. I'm going to get in trouble when I say this. Y'all can call a meeting if you want them. The church got more rules than God got. Y'all call yourself working on behalf of God and you got more rules than God got. He called a man who didn't, he called a man to be the progenitor of all the people of faith who is not a person of faith at all. He don't even know God. And God interrupts his ungodly behavior and said, man, I got three promises for you. All I need you to do is move. You messed up. Because chapter 16 says, he hearkened to the voice of his wife, Sarai. Which means both her and him went from faith to flesh. It wasn't just her. It was him too because he consented. 
Both of them went from believing God to not believing God. And now he got baby mama drama. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In chapter 16, there is no recorded dialogue between God and Abram. Abram was completely in the flesh. And God shows up at age 99 and say hey bud I know you messed up the deal is still on but this time sir when I originally called you I called you out of pure grace but this time I'm requiring you to have proper conduct before me. <laughs> Y'all missed it. When I picked the suit off the rack, I picked the suit based on what the suit was. But now after I got the suit, the suit got to be tailored. The suit got to fit my specifications. I can't get no help in here. I thought the brothers would say something around here. You just can't pick no suit up off the rack and just put it on because it's got to still be specified to your measurements. So now I'm calling you to be specified to my measurements. I want you to walk up right before me. That word perfect in verse 2 says it literally translates to be Complete. Uh, but now something strange happens. Jordan, something strange happens. This renewal of the covenant requires a change in character. Come here. If I'm giving you another chance, I need something different from you. And the only way that there is an indication of a change of character, there's got to be a change of name. Because <laughs> when I change your name, I'm only changing your name so that there will be an indication that there's a change of character. So I'm shifting you from Abram, which means high father, to Abraham which means father of many nations. You missed it. I'm changing you from what your parents named you to what I'm going to make you to be if you submit to my requirements. All right, y'all missed it, so I'll shout myself. Now, we're starting to figure out, Antoine, why it took 25 years for God to manifest the promise to Abram. It took 25 years, man, because that's how long it took to change your character before I blessed you. Because it's some stuff I'm ready to give you, but you got the wrong character. Cause so, so if I give it to you right now, you're going to blow it. So I got to put it on the layaway while I work on your stank attitude and your mentality and your mission in life to change your perspective. Because there's some stuff I got for you that requires a change in character. I want to bless you, but you're too mean. I want to bless you, but you're too arrogant. I want to bless you, but you're too selfish. I want to bless you, but you too are uh, stuck in the past and the pain of your past. And I've got to work on your character before I put something in your hands. Might it be, church, I'm blessing you so I can change you. Can I ask you a question? How long is it going to take you to change? (laughs) 
how long you going to keep living in the pain of your past? How long you going to let your past continue to be an excuse as to why you don't interact with people and why you skeptical of people and why you looking at people like they're going to hurt you? Everybody ain't your past. long you gonna let some historical hurt hold you back from moving forward if you are out of it and you didn't become what you went through the miracle has already happened how long was it gonna take cause what I got for you is gonna require a change of character It's always amazing to me how people want what they're not willing to become. You want your man to be a certain way. when really you want him to be what you are not. You want your woman to act a certain way when you're not even ready to treat her like a lady. There are certain things that are already yours, but they're delayed until your character changes. I'm almost there. You tired? I don't care. I don't care. I wish he'd sit down. I'm going to stand here longer. <clears throat> if I sense that spirit, I'm going to put five more minutes on this song. You ain't in a rush to get out of nothing else but church. The devil is alive. change your character before I put my promise in your hand can I give you the second reason why it took so long second reason why it took so long is because you don't even realize that the change is necessary now because you're really close to the promise date Come in. You missed it. See, 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 y'all don't know how to read the Bible. Let me teach you how to read the Bible. Sometimes you ought to shout just off of reading stuff. Did y'all hear what God told Abram? You missed it. He said, hey, buddy, by this time next year. <laughs> well, y'all don't know when to get happy. He said, by this time next year, what you've been waiting on for 24 years is getting ready to happen in one year. Still acting slow. There are some changes that God is going to require not because you far from what you need to be, but you're closer than where you need to be. And just when they gave up on God, they was one year away from the promise. Sarah I had already quit. Abram had already quit. Hadn't heard from God in about 15 years. And God shows up and says, man, it's time because you're closer than what you think you are. I'm going to do it in one year. 
I don't know who this is for. But God's getting ready to do some changes in your life. Because in the next year, you're going to be closer than you ever was to the promises of God that have been placed on your life. Which is why there's some changes happening now because you're in close proximity. Touch somebody, tell them you're closer than you think. Tell them you, you're closer than you think. You, you're closer than you think. Just when you gave up on God, you're closer. Can I give you the third reason why it took so long? Here's the third reason why. This is the last reason why it took so long. It took so long, Matthew Hudson. Because I needed time to change your partner. Because that woman you with is an unbeliever and she has transferred her unbelief into you instead of you transferring your belief into her. Come here. He says to Abram, Abraham, oh, by the way, your wife Sarai, I'm going to change her name to Sarah and I'm going to bless her like I'm blessing you. But it's taking me so long because it's possible that this was always about her. Y'all missed it. Ladies and gentlemen, when Abram heard from God in Ur of Chaldees, his wife was barren then. She just didn't become barren after they left. She was barren in Ur. So Abram, if you heard what God said to you in earth, why did you still take her knowing she barren? Because your relationship is a contradiction to the promise that God promised you. But you still took her anyway. I'm going to take her because I believe that what God wants to do in my life is not based on who I ain't got. <laughs> it's based on who I got. Even if who I got is a contradiction to what God said. And that marks Abram's faith that he believed that God's word is more powerful than any imperfection going on in his life and or relationship. So I'm going to change her too because ladies and gentlemen the covenant is not just based on who it comes to it's based on who it comes through. It came to Abraham but it's got to come through Sarah. I'm going to change her too because how can two walk together? Except they be agreed. And what I'm going to do to her is change her as well. And in changing her, I'm going to break her barrenness. I'm done, y'all. This is it. I'm going to break her barrenness, uh, Hagen's, and that barren wife of yours is going to give birth to my promise. Abraham laughs at God. <laughs> Hey man, you serious? I'm old and she barren and old. I didn't make that up. It's in the Bible. But 99, she 89 and barren. This not going to happen with us. 
God says it sure is. And it's going to happen next year. So Genesis chapter 17 to Genesis chapter 21 is a whole year's time. Genesis chapter 21 opens up and says, and Sarah conceived. <laughs> chapter 18, 19, and 20 is all within one year. Chapter 21 says, and Sarah conceived. And birthed a son. They called his name Isaac, which means God has laughed. You laugh thinking I couldn't do it, but a year later, who got the last laugh? That's my seed. Hey, I, hey Abraham, I'm not taking Ishmael because Ishmael is the seed of works. That's something you and your old lady concocted. That's y'all product. But Isaac is my product. And the reason why Isaac is my product is because Isaac is the seed that's raised from the dead. Slow on that side. I said Isaac is the seed that's raised from the dead. Cause if Sarah was barren, her wound was dead. But God brought a son out of a dead place and that's where the covenant is gonna be. Does that sound like somebody y'all know? Sunday morning, he was raised from the dead. who my covenant is with cause when he comes only thing I want you to say if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side I didn't do this God did this that's who my covenant gonna be with it's gonna be with the son that was raised from the dead. That's why I pick broken people. That's why I picked damaged goods. Cause I wanna show that I got all power and what you think can't be done, God can get it done. Is it anybody in here that can testify the deal is still on? Well, if the deal is still on, your praise ought to still be on. Somebody open your mouth and just thank God he didn't quit on you when you quit on him, but the deal is still on. Everyone standing. Here's what we learned today, church. The faithfulness of God will outlive the faithlessness of man. <laughs> Somebody in here has quit on God. Because he'd taken too long. Well, maybe he'd taken too long because it's taking you too long to make the necessary changes in yourself. Because I've all you've already proven that I can bless you and you mess it up. This time, I need a changed you. 
because I'm giving you another chance. Lord, I wish I had about 500 of y'all to just thank God he gave you another. Who in here got a Lord, I just thank you that you have given me another chance. To that person or person in here that says, Pastor, I'm ready now to accept the terms of the deal. It's possible and probable that I let my faith dwindle, die, fade away, dissipate, evaporate because God wasn't moving on my schedule. But can I tell you, he never made the promise based on you. He made the promise based on him. The election of God is always according to the security of his glory. I'll say it again. The election of God is always according to the security of his glory. Whoever God selects, he selects them based on the fact they're going to bring him glory. Y'all read John chapter 9. That blind man was blind and the disciples said, who did sin? him or his parents. Jesus said, neither him nor his parents, but this will be done for the glory of God. And there's somebody in here today, your life is on schedule for the glory of God. When you look back at all that you've been through, and you still here?